Good evening. Welcome everyone to uh, our program this evening, The Enduring Appeal of the Great Gatsby. Um, I'm Rebecca Roberts. I am the curator of programming at Planet Word. <laughs> and uh, if you have been able to visit Planet Word, we were able to reopen um, last week. That's it in my Zoom background. We are open Thursdays through Saturdays from 10 to 5. Uh, you can get free passes for the museum at our website, planetwordmuseum.org. Uh, if you haven't been to visit us yet, we certainly hope you will. Um, and if you found out about this program because you already subscribed to our newsletter or you're a member, thank you very much for that support. The museum is free and one of the ways we're able to stay free is because of support from folks like you. Um, if you found out about this through another channel, through the Cherry Blossom Festival or something else uh, like that and would like to find out about our events, um, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. We would love to keep you in the family or keep you in the orbit uh, to make a planet pun. Uh, our guest tonight is Maureen Corrigan. She's a professor at Georgetown University. She is a book critic on NPR. I'm sure you've heard her voice on Fresh Air for years. Um, and she, for the purposes of our conversation tonight, most relevantly, is author of And So We Read On, a book about how Gatsby came to be and why it endures. And Maureen Corrigan, I'm just so delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. So much, Rebecca. I'm really, really happy to zoom in or whatever it is we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the excuse, as if we need an excuse to talk about Great Gatsby, that the excuse we have tonight is that as of January 1st, Gatsby enters the public domain. Yeah. So tell us what that means exactly, um, both legally and from a sort of literary interpretation viewpoint going forward. Yeah. Um, it means good things and it means bad things. <laughs> so, <laughs> like so much else. <laughs> uh, the bad things, when something is under copyright, when a work of art is under copyright, as I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience know, it's protected. And in this case, Gatsby has been protected since it came out. It was published April 10th, 1925. So we're a day away from the anniversary of its publication. It's been protected by the Fitzgerald estate, um, by Scribner's. Those folks weigh in on, well, for instance, a book like mine, how much of Gatsby I can quote, um, oh. how I'm using Gatsby, what, what kind of editions of The Great Gatsby came out, you know? And so Scribner's itself has put out a graphic uh, novel version of The Great Gatsby, but it would, it would certainly not approve of any other sort of wild versions, such as the ones that are coming out now. There really is a great Gatsby zombie treatment um, that's out there. there. There are different kinds of- Why, why? <laughs> well, you know, you could also say, why not, right? Yeah, fair. Um, if, if people really are having a, a dull night after this uh, conversation of ours, just go online and look at all the pornographic uh, versions of Moby Dick. <laughs> Every kind of great novel that we've got in American uh, or world literature. You know, people have taken it and they've made it into whatever they want to make it. So now Gatsby is open to all of those treatments. On the other hand, well, you and I, and Anna, who I know from Georgetown, which is lovely, um, you and I were talking, Rebecca, before we got on this webinar about a version of The Great Gatsby that the fantasy writer Neil Gaiman showed me. He had a copy of it on his phone years ago. And this came out of, I think it was an Australian press. All of the characters in The Great Gatsby were depicted in these beautiful sepia watercolor drawings as sea creatures. And it was eerie and weird. And actually, for my to my way of thinking, it was in, in a sense truer to that weird, somewhat artificial feel of Gatsby than Baz Luhrmann's version, than mm -hmm. the 1970s version of a film version of Gatsby with Robert Redford, any other version that I can think of. So who knows? Some exciting things may happen. I'll say one more thing. If people are really Gatsby fans out there, as I hope everyone is, 
you must, must, must see John Collins production, the elevator repair service repertory company's production of GATS, which will come back. It's a seven and a half hour production of The Great Gatsby. I've seen it twice. It tours the country and it's every single page of the novel um, memorized by the actors, especially by the actor who plays Nick. And that blew me away. Now I've spoken with John Collins. He really had to fight with, with the Fitzgerald estate with Scribner's to get that production launched. And they finally agreed, thank God. So it'll be easier for, for you know, dramatic treatments like that one where you know, people just have different imaginative ways to get into the novel. So yeah. there will be some good things. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that a production, even though that is quite an investment of time to go see cats, um, that something that literally reads the book word for word because it is the language um, that is so, for me, enduring about this book. It's not even the plot. It's all kind of in past tense. You know what happens. There's, there's not a huge amount of action to me. It's the just jaw-dropping wonder of Fitzgerald's use of language. And I, I would rather hear someone read the book than see a dramatic screenplay of it almost. Yeah, the, uh, I agree with you, by the way. Um, and and in, in the 30 plus years I've been on Fresh Air as a book critic, I have to say, this is the hardest kind of novel to talk about on the radio. Huh. Because it's so much easier if you have a plot driven novel or a novel where, you know, you can talk at length about the characters. Here, the central character is an enigma. And by the way, Fitzgerald thought, well, maybe that was one of the reasons the novel didn't sell so well because Gatsby is such a mystery. But um, to, to talk about a novel on the radio that's astounding because of its language, half the listeners, not, not because people are stupid, but they're just going to kind of tune out because it's going to sound too poetic, too literary. Mm -hmm. And to hear the novel as, uh, you know, on stage in Gats, I heard things that I had never heard mm. before. And I've read this novel now, I don't know, a hundred times. How funny the first third of the novel is. It's, there's some scenes that are like Marx Brothers, um, zany comedy. Uh, and, and you don't get that if you're just sort of sitting there reading it reverentially, you don't hear that comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the last time I experienced Gatsby was an audiobook. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal recorded it a few years ago for Audible. And um, it's sort of part of their series of, of award-winning actors interpreting American classics. And it's terrific. You know, I, I huh. am not a huge Jake Gyllenhaal fan, but he does a really good job with the text. And there is something about the audiobook format that, that works. Uh, I don't want to leave the sea creatures entirely because <laughs> one of the things that uh, was pointed out to me in your book was how much water there is in Gatsby and how wet the whole story is in so many ways. And so sea creatures are not quite as weird as they might sound as an interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, well, here's what I'll say about water. <laughs> There's so much to say about water, but I make the claim, which is I think 100% true, that out of all of our great American novels, Gatsby is our great American novel that foregrounds class and class anxieties. And connected with that is the fear of going under, of losing your footing of just you know, dissolving into the crowd in America. Um, you know, and you think about how we use water imagery to talk about financial insecurity. We even talk about mortgages, you know, going under and, you know, taking on water and all of that. So I think it's crucial to a reading of Gatsby to understand how infested this novel is with water imagery because it's conveying that anxiety all the way through. My book came out in 2014. And every time I talk about the book, 
I have issued the dare to people to find one page of this novel that doesn't in some way reference water. Oh, one page. One page. And to email me. You can reach me easily, Georgetown, NPR. Nobody's ever done it. Huh. Because you can't. Every single page has you know, a verb, like when, when Tom Buchanan says in chapter one, the white race is going to be submerged. Like, he'll, you know, there'll be a verb like that. So think about the first time we see Gatsby in this novel. It's at the end of chapter one. Nick has returned from the Buchanans from that terrible dinner party reunion with his cousin Daisy. And he looks out at, at the lawn and he sees his neighbor who he hasn't met yet, Jay Gatsby, you know, that iconic scene, stretching out his arms over the water, um, you know, to, trying to reach Daisy's green light. And everybody focuses on the green light because we're, you know, well, why not? It's a strange symbol. And we all got assigned high school essays about the green light. And, yeah. Yes, yeah. But then you think about Right, that symbol of yearning, of aspiration. Fitzgerald said that the novel was about aspiration. Think about how Gatsby dies. You know, he doesn't die in a car wreck, despite all of the ink that spilled describing his car. He doesn't die on his couch with a bullet in his chest from Wilson. He dies in his swimming pool. And you know, symbolically, there's that drowning imagery that we're getting here. And I'll throw one more suggestion in. You know, uh, Daisy, in, especially in the movies, is always portrayed as a blonde, as, as very beautiful. In the book, she's not, first of all, she's described as having dark hair. And secondly, you never really hear that she's a knockout, gorgeous, you know, femme fatale, what you keep hearing about with Daisy at least 10 times is that her voice, her, it's her voice and her voice sounds like money, that famous line. And for anybody in the audience who's got any kind of classical education, um, you think about, well, who are the figures in classical mythology who are known by their voices? It's the sirens. These, these, these unearthly women, these kind of mermaid creatures who pull sailors to their watery graves because they hypnotize them by the sound of their voices. So Gatsby reaching his arms out, <laughs> you know, over the waters of Man Manhasset Bay, that, that kind of body of water, that strange body of water, that uh, Long Island Sound, that inlet there, Yes, he's reaching toward Daisy. He's reaching toward the siren. He's reaching toward what she symbolizes, which is so much more than her. But if you stretch your arms out too far, you go under. You, you, and mm -hmm. that's there from the very beginning of the novel, that, that threat, that anxiety. Um, so I, I could go on and on, but I will stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> no need. We are your people. I um, I also think it's interesting to talk about Daisy's voice in that context of class, right? Because yeah. um, voice and diction and um, accent can be such a giveaway yeah. um, of people pretending to a different class, probably less so in America than in Great Britain, but certainly in America as well. And so a voice that drips of money is full of money is also um, an indicator of, you know, something Gatsby didn't have access to and was always going to be an outsider to. You know, I'm I'm going through my notes just in in, in, in a in a silly effort to wave a piece of paper at the audience, but <laughs> James L. W. West the third, who is the general editor um, of of the authorized entire edition of, of Fitzgerald's works. Um, he, he's done this amazing job of, of showing, compiling how many versions of that passage about Daisy's voice there are that we know about because Fitzgerald worked on the novel so much and we've lost some of the drafts, but there are at least six drafts um, of, that, of that passage, that paragraph, where he keeps, Fitzgerald keeps working to perfect, 
to get it right so that really um, what you hear in that passage is right. Her voice is full of money and, and the, it, it's, it's Gatsby talking with Nick and they're trying to pin it down. You know, what is it about that voice? And, and finally, you know, Gatsby says her voice is full of money. Yeah, uh, of course, it's a great point. Voices are, are indicators of class. And by the same token, don't you hear Jay Gatsby trying too hard with his voice? Right. When he keeps saying old sport, old sport, you know, he's got this kind of Oxbridge um, faux, you know, affectation. affectation yeah. Of to, to sort of rub off the Midwestern edge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and again, thinking about class, how schematic this novel is, and yet it reads so, so easily. But we, we have three different views of the American class system in the first three chapters. So chapter one, you get old money, the dinner party at the Buchanan's. Chapter two, the Valley of Ashes, near where I grew up in Sunnyside, Queens. That's Flushing. Um, and again, for those of you who are at all familiar with New York geography, it's Flushing Meadows, which used to be the Corona ash dumps at the time that Fitzgerald was writing and living out on Long Island. He would have had to drive through there. It was a garbage dump, the Valley of Ashes. Um, and so, you know, lower class uh, where Myrtle Wilson and George Wilson live. And then chapter three, new money, the Gatsby's mansion, you know, again, and, and new money is so, so much distinguished by you have to try too hard as opposed to the folks who don't try at all in chapter one. Um, I always love to think about how when Nick enters the Buchanan's house and how he's greeted. Uh, if you go back and look at that scene, Daisy and Jordan Baker, the athlete, they barely move, <laughs> they barely move right. their, or their, their bodies. Do they do it at all? I mean, to say hello, I, no one- But Nick's one of them. Nick I mean, is, Nick is interesting, right? I mean, Nick is interesting. Nick, Nick is one of them by birth. But Nick is, he's one of those folks who's always going to be the outsider. He's the perfect narrator. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, another, another symbol pattern to look for in this novel is the number of times someone is on the outside looking in. And in chapter two, which I just mentioned, the Valley of Ashes, after Nick and Tom Buchanan go through the Valley of Ashes, they wind up at that um, love nest that Nick had. Oh my sorry, God, that, that oh yeah, little. that painful yeah. evening that just rolls <laughs> oh on God. and on. And the dog, the poor dog, Edith Wharton wrote to Fitzgerald saying, what happened to that dog at the party? I mean, she was worried about the dog. He's <laughs> a great dog lover. But Nick imagines at one point in that crazy drunken party, that he is outside on the street, looking through the windows and, and wondering what's going on. In some way, there's something that's happened to Nick that's given him that apartness. And it's part of the reason he connects with Gatsby, who's also a part, who also stands apart. Um, so, I mean, Gatsby is, Gatsby is even a part at his, at his own parties, you know? Mm -hmm. That's one of the, that's one of the scenes, I guess, that maybe Baz Luhrmann got right. You can tell I hate that movie, but <laughs> you know, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio, he's standing apart as he should be when he makes, he makes his entrance, um, which is different from the novel, but he makes the entrance at his own party. Gatsby's a guy who's not at home in his own skin and, and that comes through. Do you like any of the movie interpretations? Um, I, I have a fondness <laughs> for, for the 1949 version starring Alan Ladd, who some folks may know was a golden age movie star who's made his reputation starring as cowboys. He was the star of the, the movie Shane and gangsters. He, he always was in gangster films. And the reason I kind of think the 1949 Hollywood version is interesting is because it's, it's made as, as kind of a crime story uh, rather than primarily a love story. 
when the novel came out in 1925, and I've been through as many of the reviews as, as are still around, I would say 80% of the reviewers talked about it as a crime story. And why not? Huh. You've got a bootlegger as the main character whose name Gatsby derives from criminal slang. A gat is a machine gun. You've got three violent deaths. You know, you could go on and on and on. So of course, why not talk about it that way? And the 49 version, um, you know, it, in, it sort of enjoys that aspect of Gatsby more so than the other. Versions. So we actually have a little clip of the 49 movie. It is not super high quality, um, but it does give you a little bit of a flavor of that. Before that, the black bottom. And before that, the Charleston. Wild, careless dances beating out the crazy rhythms of the jazz man's 20s. Jazz. Robbing like the pulse of the country. Prosperity, paper profits, fortunes made overnight. Yes, the ghost signals were up. All the lights were green. And young America went joyriding on homemade hooch. Prohibition brought with it new ways to get one's hand for the big money. The speakeasy. <laughs> the gunman the bootlegger drum runners hijacker the gang boys I mean, that feels more Maltese Falcon than, you know, <laughs> glitz and glamour. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, and, and maybe, you know, we all get our, every age gets its own Gatsby. So this is 1949. <laughs> and what you're seeing in that opening, um, what we didn't see is the, the first few seconds is a scene where Nick Carraway, who's now married to Jordan Baker, the two of them go pay a visit to Gatsby's grave. And they talk about Gatsby and they have this, and, and Nick is talking and he has this kind of flashback about how wild and out of control the twenties were. So you can see the forties trying to kind of rein in the twenties the and, and also, you know, distance itself as an era from the, the excess of the twenties. Um, and then, right, that final scene is Gatsby as, as the, the bootlegger with the machine gun, you know, kind of really emphasizing where he gets his money from. Um, it, it, you're right, it is much more like the Maltese Falcon, but I also think the book has a lot in common with the Maltese Falcon. Um, Gatsby as a novel really shares a lot with early hard-boiled detective fiction. Hmm. And the emphasis on cars, on violence, absolutely the emphasis on fate. On the second page of this novel, you know that Gatsby is dead. Nothing that happens afterwards for the next 175 pages is going to change that. And for listeners familiar with, oh gosh, um, you know, any of the novels of James M. Cain, for instance, Mildred Pierce, du Double Indemnity, The Postman Always Rings Twice. You always get this voiceover of, of a man, oh, you know, sort of telling us, looking backward, how did this terrible event happen? Usually a murder. Well, that's what we're getting here. The voiceover is Nick. And what a strange thought it is, I think, to to say that one of our great American novels, I think the greatest, is, t is telling us that um, nothing's gonna be changed in this novel. All possibility is off the table because all the, these events have happened already. Mm -hmm. Nick is speaking to us in 1924, he's remembering the events of 1922. So there is, there is a lot, and the word hard boiled, by the way, which came out of World War I, 
Um, soldiers refer to tough drill sergeants as being hard boiled. That word appears in chapter one when Nick is talking about an uncle of his who was hard boiled. So it's, and you know, Fitzgerald was a fan of detective fiction. He, he tried to write a murder mystery called The Boy Who Killed His Mother, but <laughs> we don't have that. It sort of <laughs> gives away the plot right there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, speaking of sort of the 1940s interpretations, we have a question from the audience. Why did the World War II paperback of Gatsby become so popular with soldiers? Oh, yeah, that's that's such a great story. Um, some folks may know there was this amazing program during World War II in which um, all sorts of books were published actually in editions like these. I, I have a little uh, copy here. These. Um, these cheap pulp editions, which were printed over 122 million copies of everything from Margaret Mead's coming of age in Samoa to the dictionary to the Maltese Falcon, uh, you know, all sorts of books were printed um, and distributed to soldiers and sailors serving overseas and guys who were in prisoners of war camps. Um, through an, uh, an arrangement with the Red Cross. So um, you've got this, this program where the books are being sent out. And by the way, the greatest distribution of what were called these armed services editions was on the eve of D-Day, when every man who was going over in a landing craft had one of these books in his pocket. And huh. there were five D-Day editions. The most popular was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Um, there's, there's a wonderful photograph, you can find it online, of a, of a soldier. He looks like he's almost asleep, half asleep in a landing craft, and he's got a tree grows in Brooklyn open. But they were pulp editions. Um, again, this is a facsimile, but they were printed on cheap paper, double columns, stapled. They were meant to last seven times, and they lasted much more than that. Gatsby was chosen as one of these um, armed services editions. So this novel, which in 1940, Fitzgerald died in 1940 at the age of 44, of probably his third heart attack. When he died, editions of The Great Gatsby from its second printing were still in Scribner's warehouses. The book, was, the novel was basically a flop. It goes from being a flop to in 1945, 122,000 copies of The Great Gatsby are out there. And then, of course, after World War II, immediately after, you get the paperback revolution. It's picked up by Dell, other paperback companies. And the Gatsby revival starts to happen. Um, it, it, I received a letter from when my book came out from a man um, who had got read Gatsby in one of those armed services editions. And I always keep the letter with me beca because of the first paragraph and, you know, without giving his name or anything personal, just the first two sentences are, to me are so moving. Um, he wrote in 2015 to me and he said, I first met Jay Gatsby when I was getting ready to parachute into enemy territory in World War II. He appeared in a ragged armed services edition as a 19 year old para paratrooper, a mere kid. I wasn't all sure what I thought about Jay, but even then I had a pretty clear sense I was in the presence of a great man. Oh. So by the way, if folks are in town, and I don't know what the status is of the rare book room in our, our Library of Congress, but the Library of Congress has the only complete collection of every title of these armed services editions. And you can go in there <laughs> and, you know, look at the Gatsby edition, look at any of these editions. When you know a little bit about the history, um, Stephen Ambrose's great book on D-Day talks about the armed services editions and the, and the service they performed during the war. When you know about the history and you hold these books in your hand, it, it really is powerful to think about what books can give to people in, in the toughest situations. Yeah. What, what do you think was going on in America or with American readers that made them embrace Gatsby in the 40s and 
50s yeah. in a way they didn't in the 20s? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, I I think that certainly Fitzgerald's friends helped after he mm -hmm. died once again. People like Dorothy Parker, um, people like Malcolm Cowley. I mean, some of these names aren't as familiar anymore, but a, a big literary critic of the time, Edmund Wilson, who was probably America's most powerful literary critic in the, in the 20th century. They really got behind Fitzgerald's work and new editions began, began to come out with prefaces by them and that helped. But I think, you know, the, the guys who read Gatsby in these editions, by the way, the, the, and again, this is a facsimile, but the, the, the description of Gatsby on the Armed Services edition, once again, talked about this bootlegger in, in Long Island and, you know, all of the violence in the novel rather than anything that we talk about. But I think that people really came to gravitate more toward that idea of yearning, yearning for something that America promises. And after the war, maybe, maybe those promises seemed even more precious to, to think of America as a place that could embrace different kinds of people and give everybody a shot. You know, what a gift that was. Mm -hmm. Even if at the same time, the novel tells you, well, those are the promises, but they certainly don't always come true. You know, you think about the last lines of the great Gatsby. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. There's always that promise of the future, but the novel is also telling us, you know, the past has a hold on you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the most American novel and the most un-American novel at once because it, this novel has it both ways. It believes in the meritocracy and it also doesn't. <laughs> at, so at what point, I mean, obviously Fitzgerald's reputation is helped along by his friends, but that's not just Gatsby, right? That's his other work as well. So yeah. at what point does Gatsby start being mentioned in that yeah. short list of great American novels? Yeah. It happens in the 60s um, that you really see the suggestion that this might be a masterpiece. And I'm so lucky to live in Washington and I, I'm so lucky to have the great help and support of brilliant librarians. I spent a magical day at the Library of Congress in a sub, sub, sub basement with uh, Library of Congress librarian, Abby Yokelson, who does American literature. And what I was after, I was, I was trying to answer exactly that question. How, when does Gatsby really get recognized? Um, and I decided I'll go through all of those literary anthologies that so many of us mm -hmm. were exposed to in high school, sometimes even in college. And if I go through all of those literary anthologies chronologically, maybe then I can figure it out. And Abby took me down to the basement. You know, imagine miles, it seemed like miles of literary anthologies on these shelves. And we kept pulling down chronologically anthologies and shouting out to each other every time we got a Fitzgerald hit. And, um, <laughs> and so, the, the, the amazing thing about that experience was at the end of that day, Abby said to me, you know, in another couple of months, we wouldn't have been able to do this because the Library of Congress, like every other reference librarian, uni library, university library is squeezed for space. And so all of those old anthologies were being sent to an offsite storage facility and I would have had to requ request them one by one. Impossible. Right, right. Yeah. The last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm picturing with the <laughs> crates. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it was the 60s where you start getting these introductions to Fitzgerald and and some um, excerpts from Gatsby where you, you, you see this perhaps, you know, the Fitzgerald's masterpiece may be recognized as one of our great American novels. And it really, really starts to take off there. 
Um, there are also early TV treatments of The Great Gatsby. I mean, if you really <laughs> want to go deep into the weeds, go up to the Broadcast Museum in New York. Um, they've got some of these early, you know, Dumont Radio, uh, Firestone Theater versions of Gatsby. So it, it really begins oh. to take off then. And of course, Fitzgerald's amazing daughter, Scotty um, Fitzgerald, really was such a, such a, a fierce proponent of her father's work. And I think the story about both Scotty and Zelda Fitzgerald um, giving all five of the manuscripts of Fitzgerald's novels, plus his papers, meaning letters, other, other, you know, other writings, giving them to his alma mater, Princeton, um, so that other people would have access to them is, is so touching because Fitzgerald loved Princeton. He died actually reading the Princeton Alumni Bulletin and, and checking off names of promising football players in December of 1940. And Princeton has that edition of, of the bulletin that, that Fitzgerald was reading when he had his heart attack. And you see the pencil going off the page. Fitzgerald loved Princeton, but Princeton didn't, did not love Fitzgerald back right away. And when Scotty and, and Zelda Fitzgerald first tried to give Fitzgerald's papers to Princeton, the librarian at the time said, um, refuse them and, and did so in a particularly haughty way. <laughs> that, um, Princeton haughty, you're yeah. kidding. Yeah. I fact, say that I as a loyal alum. <laughs> I memorized it. He said, Princeton is not in the business of supporting indigent Southern widows of Midwestern hack writers who had the good fortune to attend Princeton, even if it was not Princeton's good fortune. <laughs> ouch. Yeah, ouch, I know. And now, of course, all of that material is priceless. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have someone asking in the Q&A, do you think any of Fitzgerald's other novels in any way come close to Gatsby? I don't, um, I really don't. I know there are a lot of tender is the night fans out there. I try with Tender is the Night. I reread it every few years. Um, I think Fitzgerald was at his greatest when he was working in confined forms. And Gatsby is like, what, 185 pages? His letters, those essays um, that he wrote, like My Lost City in the Crack Up volume, the Crack Up essays, my God. I think that, the, that there's a case to be made that The Love of the Last Tycoon, The Loves of the Last Tycoon might have been a great novel. He was also trying to get back to, as he said, the Gatsby focus on form. There are, there are lots of passages in Tender is the Night, This Side of Paradise, Beautiful and Damned, the New York novel, that I think are breathtaking. But as a whole, I don't think anything comes close to Gatsby. And Fitzgerald thought it was his masterpiece. Mm. You know, you mentioned in your book that a lot of us are introduced to The Great Gatsby in high school. Yeah. And perhaps that's too young. You say that perhaps we need a little bit more perspective in our own lives to appreciate its genius. Yeah. Perhaps I was wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's an older professor kind of being snobby. I don't know. I've, I've, look, I have amazing students at Georgetown um, who aren't that much older than those high school kids. I've been in enough high school classrooms and auditoriums and I've heard some such heartfelt and smart um, and sensitive readings of the novel. I think the problem is maybe that, of, of course, teachers sometimes have to teach to the test. And so you do get the emphasis on all the symbols and this is such a symbol infested novel. Um, and, you know, the movies don't help because they emphasize the love story. So I think that maybe it does take 
some perspective, some years behind you to hear that yearning, that regret in Nick Carraway's voice. Nick is carried away by his love for Gatsby and that yearning for his, his friend who, who he'll never have back because he's dead. I mean, I mentioned the word schematic a while ago. Another way in which this novel is so over-designed is that everybody in it is reaching for somebody or something that they will never have. Um, think about Myrtle reaching for Tom, Tom reaching for Daisy. I would say maybe Daisy's the only character, this sort of sun around which everybody else revolves, who's so self-involved, she's not reaching for anything. But um, it, it's such a pattern in the novel. And Nick's voice, that's what grabbed me after I got a little smarter and I got out of high school. I was one of those high school kids who didn't get it. You know, what's the big deal? But when I, when I heard that voice the second or third time, oh my God, <laughs> mm. it's hypnotic. I also wonder if, you know, if, if you know anything about Gatsby just culturally, it feels like a synonym for the 1920s or the, you know, the roaring 20s. And yeah. so people have Gatsby parties where everyone dresses as a flapper and has long pearls and drinks gin. And, yeah. you know, a new bar just opened here in Washington in the Navy Yard uh, neighborhood just last week called Gatsby. Um, in, it's meant to sort of evoke that glamour and uh, rebelliousness. And if you expect the book to be all about glamorous parties and, you know, Marcel hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is that in part. I mean, it's it, sure. Gerald loved that stuff. He loved money. He loved drinking. He loved, you know, he loved the high life and paid for it. Um, but right, I, I mean, the reason I keep sniping at Baz Luhrmann and the Jack Clayton 1970 version and on and on is because they they not only foreground the romance, but they they really it's so visual you can hardly blame them. They you know the so gorgeous of those yeah. parties. And of course we had with the Lerman version, the tie-in with the now departed Brooks Brothers. You could get that straw boater hat for $200 and Daisy's pearls, but that's not what the novel is about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, I've been to those parties um, and I don't wanna be the Grinch who says, oh, you know, you're, you're misreading the novel. It, 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 it's, it's fun, it was an amazing age. And I, I, I'm sure everybody's heard, there's predictions that we'll be entering a new twenties age once this pandemic, please God, is, is behind us. But, um, but that age comes to an end. And I think it's amazing, another amazing thing about Gatsby, it's predictive quality and the last third of the novel, the lights go out in Gatsby's mansion. The party is over. So many culture, cultural critics have said that there's this sense in the novel of what's about to come in America, what's on the horizon in America, that the great national party is going to end soon and the depression or something is like it is going to come upon us. Um, and of course, the novel also predicts Fitzgerald's own funeral, which uh, was very much like Gatsby's funeral, took place in the rain, not that many people came, and the minister who performed the service really didn't know who Fitzgerald was. He just heard bad things about him. So it's, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know how much you want to ascribe to great literature, but I, I, I think our great writers are in some way seers and I think Fitzgerald was one. We have a bunch of audience questions I want to get to. One um, thematically follows from what you were just saying. Wasn't Fitzgerald viewed unfavorably during his lifetime, not just by Princeton, but in his hometown because of his alcoholism and shocking behavior? Isn't that why he's buried in Montgomery County, Maryland? Um, he was not he was not hailed um, as, as a conquering hero by all the folks he grew up with, by that by the crowd back in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he mostly grew up. Um, you know, it was partly, and so many writers run into this, be, partly because of how he wrote about his upbringing. If you go back to this side of paradise, he's not, al he's not always writing about St. Paul um, in a positive way, same in the short stories. So some of that 
is because of how he wrote about St. Paul. Um, he's buried in, in, Rock, in Rockville, uh, in St. Mary's Churchyard, which is a beautiful place to, to visit if, if you're in town. He's buried there um, for a different reason because his father's family was from this area. And so that's, that's the Fitzgerald family plot there. And of course, the, the terrible story about that plot regarding Fitzgerald is when he died in December of 1940, he was denied burial in the family plot by the archdiocese because it was the official reason was that he had not performed his Easter duty as a Catholic for years. He hadn't taken communion. He hadn't gone to confession. He didn't attend mass. Um, also, there was the suggest he was living with Sheila Graham, the gossip columnist in Hollywood, uh, out of wedlock. And of course, you know, right, he was seen as somebody who wrote these novels that were sort of risque. So he was buried in uh, Rockville Union Protestant Cemetery. But years later, Scotty Fitzgerald in the 70s got both her father and her mother, Zelda was gone by then, got got them moved into the finally into the family burial site in St. Mary's um, churchyard. And at that time, um, the slab was put on Scott and Zelda's grave that has the last words of the great Gatsby on it. It's, it's really a beautiful site. And of course, people leave all sorts of tributes there. They leave bottles. I wish they wouldn't because alcoholism was certainly one of the contributing factors to Fitzgerald's death. They leave manuscripts. I've seen pennies. I'm not really sure why that is, but um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful churchyard. Um, we have a question with so much attention being paid recently to Hemingway, uh -huh. who won a Nobel Prize. How would you compare Fitzgerald's work to his? Well, um, I love Hemingway. I, I, I love early Hemingway, especially. Uh, we always read the Nick Adams stories in my Fitzgerald seminar at, at Georgetown. Um, the Sun Also Rises has, I think, the second greatest line in 20th century literature at the end of the novel. Remember um, the line, isn't it pretty to think so that Jake Barnes says to Lady Brett Ashley, it's such a wonderful line because it ushers in that cynicism that we think of um, as, as sort of being a hallmark of, of the twenties and beyond in mod modernist literature. Um, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're both giants of American literature However, <laughs> Hemingway was terrible to Fitzgerald. I mean, Fitzgerald was the reason why Hemingway was signed by Scribner's. Hemingway was kind of the unknown writer. Fitzgerald reached out to him when they were both in Paris in 1925, introduced him to Max Perkins, the legendary editor uh, at Scribner's who worked with Hemingway, Fitzgerald, um, Marjorie Kinnon's Rawlings, you know, so many American writers um, whose work we treasure. And Hemingway did not repay Fitzgerald's kindness. In fact, um, you know, understandably, I think he got fed up with, with Fitzgerald showing up drunk at his door in Paris. By then, Hemingway was married, had a young son. But also, Hemingway became very jealous of Fitzgerald. And when The Great Gatsby came out and got so many of these kind of silly reviews about it, you know, only being a crime story or, um, you know, somehow being a retread of this side of paradise and, and the beautiful and damned, people not getting it. There was this amazing review that came out in a magazine called The Dial that was published by T.S. Eliot. Eliot was a great admirer of Gatsby. And the, the, the critic, Gilbert Seldes, wrote this review that every novelist would want. Seldes got it, and he went on and on about Gatsby. And Hemingway wrote Fitzgerald a letter about that review. And he says, too bad about that Gilbert Seldes review in The Dial. After you get a review like that, it ruins you for writing your next novel. It was almost like he was putting this, 
Hers. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, later on, Fitzgerald, of course, slid into depression as Hemingway himself did. He was struggling with alcoholism. Zelda was in a sanitarium from 1929 on until her death in the 40s, in and out of sanitariums. Um, he had money troubles. He writes to, to Hemingway and Hemingway kind of jokingly suggests, why don't you kill yourself so that Scotty and Zelda can collect the insurance money? And again, to say that to someone who's fragile, who's asking for help, it, it's hard. I mean, Hemingway, Hemingway was, um, was a tough person to stay connected with. And from what I have read, what I know, he did that to a lot of his friends. He, he, uh, he turned on them. Mm. We have a question from a high school English teacher who is wondering if you have any suggestions of how you can share and capture the beauty of Gatsby in this pandemic hybrid teaching environment. Oh gosh, my, my, my heart goes out to you. I, I'm teaching on Zoom and it's tough. Uh, it's, it's tough with college students. I can only imagine it's gotta be tougher with, with high school students. Um, I think the wisdom of this online teaching is that we do things in shorter segments. And so one thing Gatsby has going for it, right, is that it's a short novel. <laughs> and um, I, I think now that the copyright is expired, you do have all of this visual uh, stuff available to you, including uh, so many of the, the, the images um, from from other Gatsby treatments, I, I, certainly the movies. I would, I, I've used the movies just to talk about, well, well, what is the, what kind of choices is the director making here in terms of the shirt scene? You know, the famous shirt scene where where Gatsby is throwing shirts at Daisy and you know trying to impress her with his higher station in life. Um, I think you know, Rebecca. You mentioned the audio book, hearing the language. I think really anything you can do to vary how you present Gatsby will only be to the good. I, I wish Gats were available for for students to hear because those actors did such an astounding job. But I I think I would. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things online that some of them I've used, uh, virtual tours of St. Paul, Minnesota, where Fitzgerald grew up and talking about the influence of those sites, um, Gatsby maps of Long Island. So I, it is a novel that's voice driven, that's language driven. And I think maybe um, sometimes I've asked students to read passages and, and you know, that kind of maybe focuses attention on certain passages. You've probably thought of all of these tricks, but I would just try to vary every, every kind of different medium that I could get into to, uh, to talking about Gatsby. Oh, something that's online now that wasn't online before the copyright um, expired are three voice recordings. The only three voice recordings that we have of Fitzgerald's voice. He's not reading Gatsby, he's reading two Shakespeare sonnets and a Keats Ode to the Nightingale. But um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting, I think, to hear his voice, because uh, he seems so far away, yeah. Henry, all over the place. He's in movies, you know, you, we hear his voice on interviews, Fitzgerald, because he died so young, uh, relatively, there isn't that much available to, to kind of connect with him that way. With all of these interpretations that we're likely to see, you mentioned zombie Gatsby, Gatsby undead. <laughs> Is there anything you're really looking forward to? Have you heard whispers of something that you think? I know that really um, there's a British television series in the works that's kind of um, going into Fitzgerald's life and with Gatsby. I know this because the writer contacted me, you know, and talked about my book and unfortunately didn't invite me to help write the series. <laughs> I would have liked that. I know, um, the nerve. But I, I, I'm interested to see that. Um, so that's one thing in the works that, that I'm interested in. Um, I like, it's, it's just come out, but I, I do like the Scribner's graphic novel 
version of, of Gatsby. I, it doesn't try to be um, sort of cute or try to be too tied to 20s Art Deco style. And it takes some liberties. And absolutely, I'm looking forward to that Gatsby as sea creatures uh, treatment coming out. I hope that comes out soon. Well, Maureen Corrigan, it has been a pleasure to spend an hour with you. Thank you for talking Gatsby with us. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Maureen, thank you so much. It's been thank a pleasure. You, Thanks. Good night, everyone.